Hi everyone, my name is Thomas and I'm the class of 2020 PharmD candidate from Keck Graduate Institute School of Pharmacy and Health Sciences. And today we'll be talking about pediatric nutrition support. So the things I want to go over today are uh, first differentiate anthropometric parameters of the neonatal, infant, and adolescent populations. And then we'll learn how to assess nutrition status in these pediatric patients. We're going to determine the best route of nutrition support, so either like internal nutrition or parenteral nutrition, and we'll look at some monitoring parameters and complications of these uh, nutrition support routes. Okay, before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few uh, general pediatric and nutrition definitions. Uh, first of all, pediatrics are split up into different age categories, the first one being infant, which is defined as 0 to 2 years old. Next category is childhood, which is 2 to 12 years old, and then we have adolescent from 12 to 21 years old. Now we're not going to go into too much detail about these, this adolescent group just because um, generally adolescents at this age can begin to tolerate adult formulas and maybe transition from the pediatric formulas into the adult formulas. And for malnutrition, uh, we have acute malnutrition, which is defined as less than three months of duration and generally these patients can regain their weight and recover uh, relatively quickly once we start nutrition support. As for chronic malnutrition that's defined as greater than three months and uh, with these patients they may have uh, more severe consequences that, that could affect their weight, their height, brain development, and head circumference. So whenever we talk about something new or a new topic I think it's really important that we understand why it's important and why we should care about this as pharmacists. So malnutrition in pediatrics is super important because it's a major uh, clinical manifestation or a major cause of severe deviations from standard growth measurements. And these deviations from the standard growth measurements are actually associated with increased morbidity, impaired physical functional capacity, and cognitive functional capacity as well as decreased survival and in terms of cognitive development it can actually affect um, cognitive ability and psychosocial development and then here this bottom corner we actually have two different pictures of myself as a kid so you know just keep that in mind as we go through this lecture okay so the first thing we're going to go over are the anthropometric parameters which are in other terms, the different parameters that we look at to assess the nutrition status of pediatric patients. So this first one here is weight for length, and we're going to be using the WHO, or the World Health Organization, uh, reference growth charts for this age category of the first two months. So this will be infants ages 0 to 2, 24 months old. And in this category, we actually expect to see a doubling in their birth weight in their first five to six months of life and then a tripling in their birth weight at the one year mark. The next one we use is the BMI, and that um, we usually use for ages 20, uh, older than two years or older than 24 months. And we actually don't use the WHO, we switch over to the CDC growth or the reference charts uh, for BMI. And we don't use that um, for the earlier stages in life just because the BMI goals uh, change pretty often during the first few months because infants grow pretty rapidly and BMI is not as reliable as weight for length uh, in that in the infant category. The next one is head circumference and this is important because this is where uh, most of the brain or sorry most of the brain growth occurs in the first three years of life and it helps us really predict any delays in learning or psychomotor development and with this, we kind of go back to the WHO international growth charts uh, for reference. And if we look over here to the table on the right, um, you'll see that I put in um, a table showing the different birth weights are separated in, in, into different categories. And this will be pretty important when we talk about nutrition support later. As we'll see, everything is really weight based. Okay, so the next couple of anthropometric parameters are the mid upper arm circumference and the tricep skin fold. So for the for the mid upper arm circumference or the MUAC, uh, it measures the composite of the muscle, fat, and bone, uh, and it's most 
mostly used for patients at the age of six months to about five years or 59 months. And one caveat with this is that it, it requires specific training in soft tissue anthropometry. So um, it might be difficult to access someone who, who would be able to measure this accurately for you. The next one is the tricep skin fold. And this is actually um, one of the best single measurements for body fat percentage for specifically the ages of six to 12. And then afterwards it becomes less reliable generally because at this age, um, kids will usually go through puberty and then their body composition kind of changes a little bit um, in terms of like muscle growth and like fat distribution. So it becomes slightly less relevant or reliable at, after the age of 12. And the thing I want to mention here is that both of these assess fat mass and fat free mass. And they're actually a little bit more accurate when we're talking about um, children in the extreme ends of the growth charts. Uh, and that's referring to the less than 3 percentile or the greater than 97 percentile. Okay, so when we're talking about actually using those parameters to measure uh, or assess nutrition status, um, there, we don't actually go by certain um, ranges. We actually use something called a z-score. And if you remember from like statistics, a z-score will essentially tell you how far you are away from, or how many standard deviations you are away from the average. And a z-score of zero, for example, will tell you that you are exactly at the average or you will be at the 50th percentile. And a z-score of negative three, and this one's really important because this is significant. Z-score of negative three um, has a nine times or greater than nine times likelihood of death from inter intercurrent illness compared to a z-score of negative two. And if we just pause and look at the bottom of this table that I put, you can see that a z-score of negative three is associated with um, the, a less than the third percentile, and it shows stunted growth, severely underweight, severely malnourished, and potential wasting. And in this patient population, they're in dire need of immediate nutritional support, and they're at the highest risk of refeeding syndrome. So we need to monitor for that when we're giving nutrition support to these patients. And another thing we use to assess nutrition status is something called dynamism of growth, and that's the rate of change of growth, essentially. And it may be a cause for concern if, they, if the patient has a change in their z-score of greater than one compared to a previous measurement. And I, do, I just wanna mention that this is not always like the end all be all because um, children can go at various rates and it is not out of the ordinary actually for someone to be for example at the 90th percentile in terms of um, growth rate and then a couple months later drop down to maybe like the 15 to 20 percentile because that's actually um, considered normal or possible in this in pediatric patients. Okay, so this is a chart that you may or may not have seen before, uh, maybe at like a pediatrics uh, physician's office. Um, it'll, uh, this is like a chart that helps us assess the length, head circumference, and weight of pediatric patients. And at the very bottom, you can see it goes by the age along the x-axis, and then either weight or length along the y-axis. And the really dark black line in the middle of each of these parameters is actually the 50th percentile or z-score of zero. And then the dotted lines above and below correlate to different percentiles, like above or below the average. All right, so when we're talking about managing malnutrition, the most important thing really is to determine the etiology or the underlying cause of the malnutrition. And these are some examples of potential causes. So we have inadequate dietary intake, increased requirements, malabsorption, and altered nutrient utilization. And at the very bottom here, I just put one very brief example that there are many different types of inflammatory conditions, but they can cause decreased appetite, increased metabolism, malabsorption, and nutrient wasting. And that's one reason why we do monitor CRP in these patients. Okay, nutrition requirements. So as I mentioned earlier, 
Infants are expected to double their birth weight at the six-month six mark and then triple their birth weight at the 12-month mark. And a lot of these, there's various um, energy requirement or caloric requirement calculations, and they're all kind of based off the average daily intake of full-term infants. And uh, you may have heard this term before called the estimated average requirement um, and compare that to the recommended daily allowance, RDA. So there is a big difference, though. The estimated average requirement is just the minimum requirement needed for maintenance of 50% of the patient population compared to the recommended daily allowance, which is actually um, what's required for maintenance for about for the majority of the population, like 97 to 98% of the population. Um, and then indirect calori calorimetry, we know, is like the gold standard. However, it is a little bit difficult to access this sometimes when we need to determine the resting energy expenditure. So there are many different other estimators. Like the major difference between nutrition requirements in adults compared to nutrition requirements in pediatrics is that in adults, we're really focused on just maintenance calories and making sure that the patient doesn't uh, waste away or the patient isn't overfed. However, in uh, pediatrics, especially premature infants, we really want them to be growing. So we actually need an excess calories um, relative to their total energy expenditure. And there are studies that show that in premature infants, a poor early postnatal growth is actually associated with impaired neurocognitive development overall. And there are other complications as well, including respiratory distress syndrome and necrotizing enterocolitis. And on the next slide, I actually blew up this image into a much bigger table here. So let's take a look. Uh, the, the main thing I really want to go over is right down in the middle, we have energy in terms of kcal per kilogram per day. And uh, it's all based off body weight. So well, let's just do the first column, for example. Uh, the loss expenditure, or the total energy expenditure of the day, is 60 kcal per kilogram per day. And that's actually calculated by adding up the resting energy expenditure right below that, um, plus the other expenditure. So 45 plus 15 will end up being the total energy expenditure of 60 kcal per kilogram per day. Uh, most importantly, though, however, there is this uh, growth parameter that we want to include in our energy requirements, and that's this 29 here, right below that. And that's just an, um, 29 kcal per kilogram per day is how many extra calories are needed to maintain a healthy growth rate uh, for this size or this body weight infant or fetus. Calcium, phosphorus, and iron are a few of the most important nutrients that we can supplement for infants or, pe or premature infants specifically because in the last trimester of development, it's the period of the greatest bone mineral growth and it's also the period where uh, greater than 80% of the iron is accrued. So um, these patients, the premature infants specifically, are at the highest risk of either low bone mass or just deficiencies in these nutrients. And for specifically calcium and phosphorus, the main issues we have here are that it's, the supplementation is limited to tolerance to the enteral feeds or the incompa incompatibility in the PN bags. And for iron, uh, the, the pediatric incidence is actually the highest for iron deficiency at the age of 6 to 20 months. And then the next most common incidence period is during the puberty um, age category. So um, and that's also why we monitor for hemoglobin and hematocrit, just to make sure the patient doesn't, isn't suffering from anemia. And then I have here some examples of birth weights and the iron supplementation that we give for these different birth weights. Okay, so uh, fluid requirements. I have just have one brief slide on fluid requirements. If you don't know this formula, I would highly, highly, highly recommend you have this uh, formula memorized. And essentially what it's saying here is that the first 10 kilograms of body weight for the infant uh, will be supplementing them with 100 mils per kilo and the next 10 kilos that they weigh will add on another 50 mils per kilo. And then any kilograms after the first 20 kilograms, we add on 20 mils per kilo. Uh, 
Okay. So when we're determining formula selection for enteral feeds, um, this is very, very general, but there are many different formulas on the market, and we're just going to be trying to select the formula that is most appropriate for the age and the disease state of the patient. And like I mentioned before, at around the age of 10 to 12, uh, pediatric patients can actually begin to receive adult formulas. So this is really for um, patients that are below that age category. Okay, so we can finally start talking about enteral nutrition. Okay, so enteral nutrition, just like in adults, is actually the preferred method when we're um, providing nutrition support. And there are many different benefits um, in pediatric patients as well as in adult patients for enteral feeds over parenteral feeds. And some of these include normal organ function, um, more blood flow to the GI tract, uh, it prevents structural and functional complications of the gut barrier. There's fewer metabolic complications, uh, lower infection risk, and lower cost. Okay, so here are some of the indications and contraindications for enteral nutrition use. So, of course, if we're going to be giving food enterally, the GI tract must be functional. And if it's not quite fully functional yet, in case of like a premature infant with an underdeveloped GI tract, um, they can actually be on both parenteral feeds as well as enteral feeds until they can tolerate just the enteral feeds alone. And then some other indications for EN are inadequate oral intake, uh, airway protection, and uh, this is important because premature infants um, have an immature sucking and swallowing technique or coordination, so they may be at a higher risk of like choking, so this might be a reason why we want to give them uh, EN for the time being. And uh, inadequate intestinal function, this can be worked around um, by using a continuous drip feeding instead of bolus feeding. And for contraindications, if the GI tract is uh, not functional or we cannot access it safely, then of course we cannot use enteral feeds. And some examples here are severe mucositis, thrombocytopenia, um, severe damage to the face or esophagus, burns, and then for a non-functional GI tract, some examples are necrotizing enterocolitis or ileus. And this one is controversial, but hemodynamic instability as well, and severe respiratory failure. Okay, so once we've decided that we're going to do enteral feeding, we next have to decide uh, which access site we want to go through either gastric or into the stomach, or post-pyloric, which is just right below that, um, past the pyloric sphincter. And for gastric feeds, um, the benefits are that it's easier to place, it's uh, more closely physiologic in terms of feeding, because um, food is going into the stomach, which is more natural, um, and it actually allows for bolus or hyperosmolar feeds as well. Um, because it's going into the stomach instead of the small intestine. And this one is usually preferred as long as gastric uh, access is safe and possible. And we'll use post-pyloric um, enteral access only when um, there are certain complications that are present. For example, gastroparesis, gastric outlet obstruction, um, if the patient is at a higher risk of aspiration or is on a mechanical vent. Okay, so enteral nutrition initiation and advancement and the main thing I want to emphasize here is that initiation and advancement is highly 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 dependent on the age the underlying disease the risk of refeeding for the individual and then current clinical condition for the individual and I put one example here uh, critically ill um, we should be initiating enteral feeds within the first 24 to 48 hours and then reaching the goal at about, or reaching, sorry, two-thirds of the goal caloric intake by the end of the first week. And for um, intermittent or bolus feeds, uh, we want to really match the interval of our boluses with the normal eating pattern. And that's highly dependent on age as well as other factors. For example, in infants, uh, if they're going to be eating every three to four hours on average, then we should be using our bolus or intermittent feeds every three to four hours to match that. And for a child that might be slightly older, maybe like seven or eight years old, uh, and, and is usually eating every six hours, then we should just 
make our feeds every six hours. And then the rate and volume is really highly dependent on the tolerance of the patient um, specifically, as well as their response to the regimen, um, looking at their growth rate and their weight gain, as well as their GI tract status. And here I put um, just very general examples of a bolus and a continuous pump uh, internal feed initiation and advancement examples. The first one here being initiation of the bolus at 25% of the goal, and then we'll divide the rest of the feeds um, by the number of times you're going to be feeding that day. And then for continuous pump, I just put an example here of 1 to 2 mLs per kilo per hour, and then we'll advance by half to 1 mL per kilo per hour every 6 to 24 hours. Okay, so let's go over some enteral nutrition complications and monitoring parameters. So in an, uh, so for patients who are receiving extended periods of enteral nutrition, they may lack that oral stimulation that helps them develop their sucking and swallowing ability. So in these patients, we can work around that by um, providing early speech and occupational therapy to help them recover um, or help their oral recovery. And then the next complication is mechanical complications. Um, several fall under this category, for example, infection um, through tube access. And this is very important because um, it's, we should be aware that powdered EN formulas are not sterile, and therefore they have a sh shorter hang time. And that's compared to like the closed, the closed systems, which actually are sterile. However, um, so they'll have a longer hang time, but they may be more expensive. And we have GI complications uh, like abdominal distension, cramping, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, or dumping syndrome. And we have some metabolic complications like hyperglycemia, for example. And then tube occlusion and positioning. So especially in like pediatric patients, you may have um, <clears throat> excess movement in these patients. So they may actually pull their postpyloric tube up and towards their stomach and then that'll lead to a gastric access instead and then that can lead to aspiration. Uh, the next complication is refeeding syndrome. This is no different than in adults. We have to uh, make sure we're not refeeding patients, especially when they're malnourished. And the last one is micronutrient deficiency. And this is usually um, mainly because enteral nutrition formulas are fixed formulas. So for patient-specific um, individuals who may need uh, slightly more of certain micronutrients, um, it's difficult to it's difficult to individualize these formulas for them. All right. Finally, we can talk about some parenteral nutrition. So some indications for parenteral nutrition are that. Um, the patient must be unable to self-sustain on enteral diet alone. Uh, their GI tract is not functional, so they cannot use enteral feeds. And I put some examples here, like premature neonates uh, with congenital heart disease, GI disease, necrotizing enteral colitis, short bowel syndrome, or SBS. If they're critically ill, um, if they're on ECMO, and with vasopressor support. And then other indications are failure to thrive, graft versus host disease, which is just like a complication of stem cell transplant, and then cancer with chemotherapy, because that can cause a lot of um, GI issues. Okay. So in terms of parenteral initiation and advancement, um, this, is, this table is actually really, really helpful for initiation and advancement. Um, and they split it up into three different categories. So for infants, they actually define that as less than one year and then children as 1 to 10 years, and then adolescents um, maybe more similar to adults after the 10-year mark. And then um, at the top here, we have premature or low body weight um, patients. Early PN is actually um, recommended within the first 24 to 48 hours of life, and we continue the parenteral nutrition until EN is tolerated. And if they're not premature or low body weight, so just for all the other neonates, um, we'll start the parenteral nutrition only if enteral nutrition is expected to be delayed uh, for about for more than two to three days. So that's either oral or uh, tube feeding. <clears throat> so some macronutrients that we put into 
the PN bag. The first one is protein. This is probably the most important one because there are specialized amino acid concentrations uh, for pediatric patients. They'll have higher concentrations of certain amino acids and lower concentrations of others. Uh, the most important one actually being cysteine because that helps lower the pH uh, much more than the other amino acids. And that lower pH is very important because it helps with the stability of the calcium phosphorus and helps us uh, supplement with higher concentrations of calcium and phosphorus. And then dextrose, there's not much to say about that. Usually it's just 10 to 12.5% in the peripheral PN bags um, and then up to 25% in the central axis uh, parenteral nutrition. And when we're talking about IV fat emulsion here, there's just a couple of warnings that I want to mention. Um, for a high phospholipid to triglyceride ratio, that's actually associated with a decreased triglyceride clearance in the neonate population. And the other warning is that we want to infuse IV fat emulsion as slow as possible because of the risk of pulmonary fat accumulation and death in premature infants with IV fat emulsion. So we don't want to exceed 0.25 grams per kilogram per hour. And we actually also want to avoid the 3-in-1 30% IV fat emulsion bags uh, in neonates and infants for the same reason. Yeah. So in terms of micronutrients and electrolytes, um, they may actually be deferred and held for the first day and deferred onto the second day due to the monitoring intensity for these patients. Because we do need to get a baseline level uh, before we start adding all of these micronutrients. Uh, for example, potassium, that one's usually added once there's a normal urine output and kidney function. And then for sodium, we'll add to the bag once diuresis begins. And for calcium gluconate, that's um, specifically calcium glu gluconate is the preferred salt um, for calcium phosphate this stability. And I put here a calcium phos ratio that we use in PN bags as 1.7 milligrams of calcium gluconate to one milligram of phosphorus. And I also converted that to MEQs per kilogram per day um, for you guys here. And then this table on the, on the right also is a good reference for how much sodium, potassium, calcium, phosphate, uh, magnesium to add. Okay, and for vitamin supplementation for pediatrics, there's a pediatric multivitamin formula for um, peds age less than 11 years old. And then once they hit 11 and older, uh, but they're still pediatric patients, um, they can be switched to the adult multivitamin formula. Just be aware that there are products with and without vitamin K. Uh, so we want to choose the ones that do have vitamin K included when we're supplementing vitamins for pediatric patients. And once again, all of these are still weight-based dosing. And as for trace elements, we just have a good um, reference chart from the text that tells us how much of the different trace elements we should be adding. Also weight-based. Okay. So for um, other additives to PN bags, the first one I have here is not in bold because it's not technically recommended by Aspen guidelines, and you may or may not see it um, depending on the hospital you're at. And it's usually used, heparin is usually used to reduce, reduce the risk of CLABSI or central line associated bloodstream infections. And it's also used to reduce the risk of um, catheter or central line access thrombus. Now the, the next two here are much more important and they are required in pediatric PN bags. So the first one here is carnitine. And carnitine in normal humans, um, adults, are used to transport long chain fatty acids into the mitochondria for energy production and energy utilization. Now for premature neonates and infants, they have an immature pathway, um, fatty acid like transportation pathway. So they'll need extra carnitine uh, supplementation. And for long-term uh, PN patients, they're going to need about 10 to 15 milligram per kilogram per day. And then for neonatal PN uh, with no enteral source and so no oral or no tube feeds, um, their carnitine supplementation will be an additional uh, 
will just will just be two to five milligram per kilogram per day. And the other one that's mandatory is the cysteine. And I did mention this one earlier as well because it helps decrease the pH in the PN bag to allow for higher calcium phosphate concentration. And the dose here we give as usually 30 to 40 milligram per gram of pediatric amino acids. Okay, so we're almost done here. Pediatric monitoring. Um, prior to initiation, so these are like the baseline monitoring parameters that we want to look at. And then following the PN initiation, we'll have follow-up labs that we want to check. So for baseline, we want to look at the serum electrolytes, glucose, uh, liver function test, t bile prealbumin, albumin, triglycerides, BUN, serum creatinine, and CBC, as well as uh, a baseline weight and height so we can uh, measure growth rate, uh, fluid status, and clinical status. And then after initiation, we'll continue to look at the electrolytes, glucose, triglycerides, um, growth, so we can check their, uh, the rate of growth daily, uh, any improvements in clinical status, and periodically, we'll be looking at the micronutrients, like the ones I listed below here. Okay, and this is just one example of frequency of monitoring uh, parameters. Now, monitoring, again, is individualized and case-by-case. Case. So more severe patients may be monitored more frequently than less severe patients. And then as they become more and more stable, we can push the follow-up periods a little bit later and later. All right, so I believe this is the last slide. We're going to go over general PN complications. So just like in adults, we have refeeding syndrome. We have to be aware of that. Um, the next one is central line uh, associated bloodstream infections or CLABSI. And one way we can uh, work around that is using something called an antimicrobial lock therapy with either vancomycin, gentamicin, or just 70% ethanol. And we kind of just use that to like sterilize the catheter, to prevent any infections there at the access site. And then there are several mechanical errors. For example, um, errors in the infusion device, the PN bag, or any leaks in the catheter. Um, just like in adults, we also have PN-associated liver disease, or p -nulled. Uh We have metabolic bone disease, and we have a central fatty acid deficiency. And here are my references, and I want to thank you guys for sticking with me through this entire lecture.